I don't think there's a woman in Michigan politics, uh, either in the Capitol or working in and around Lansing, um, that hasn't experienced some sort of bias because of their gender. Whether it's men repeating what we already said, or the preconceived notion that being assertive makes us bossy. There certainly have been times uh, that I've been underestimated because I'm a woman. Um, in those situations, I have countered that by being twice as prepared as the guy next to me. The political culture in Lansing is one that continues to reward cis, straight, white men. Power rewards power. And sexual harassment is one example of that. As a woman in politics, there are definitely a lot of power dynamics that are at play that you have to take into consideration either consciously or subconsciously as you're doing your job. It's traditionally been a men's arena and as more and more women get involved, I think we're starting to see that women are coming together and we're leading together. And um, you know, some of the behaviors that we've had to self-correct or adapt around are uh, being called out as inappropriate or unacceptable. So many of our colleagues have known for years about the harm, about the harassment, about the violence against women and femmes in politics and have either offered genuine empathy or feigned empathy, but have continued to reward those perpetrators with contracts have shared projects with them and have done nothing to stop the harm. I've heard from so many women uh, in the political bubble of Lansing that this is really commonplace. That, I also think, is part of why it was able to persist and why uh, when we did uh, tell people what, like, small bits of what were happening, it wasn't taken seriously because it is so pervasive. I hope that the reckoning that is happening now makes it clear that it's not normal and that's not how people should be treated. The women at MLive who reported on this are veterans of the Lansing Press Corps and unfortunately are no strangers to sexism in the capital culture themselves. I caught up with Lauren Gibbons and Emily Lawler to talk about what they found during their weeks of reporting, some of the recent changes within the State House and Senate when it comes to harassment policy, and what needs to happen next. What was the final trigger or the final story that you said, all right, Lauren and I are going to get together and we are going to start talking with women on the record about what's been happening. Yeah, so over the past couple of years, we've had um, sort of a number of high profile incidents. And actually about a year ago, there was um, a Macomb County prosecutor now, Pete Lucido, uh, was publicly accused by multiple women um, of inappropriate conduct. And I'd started making some calls then a year ago, and it just really didn't feel like people were ready to go on the record about this. But um, you know, as we saw more of these incidents come out, um, uh, the TJ Buchholz accusations came out this spring. I think that um, for us, it was important to get at sort of like the systemic culture that allows this to happen continually. And the reason that these aren't one-off instances, and we're going to see more of these one-off instances, frankly, if the culture doesn't change. And I think, Lauren, it's that whisper campaign that it was a well-known problem, but it was only communicated from woman to woman and passed through department to department and saying, well, you've got to watch out for this. This is not something that came as a surprise to any anyone that we contacted for this story, any woman that we spoke with. Um, I think where a lot of the surprise came when our final reporting came out came from men who maybe didn't realize the extent of this issue, didn't realize how much of this was behind the scenes, how much women were talking amongst each other because they feared the repercussions of coming out. So Emily, you spoke with 40 women who work or have worked in the political sphere. 32 said that they had experienced harassment. Only seven of them chose to actually report it. Women described uh, 
sort of casual sexism. Um, certainly, uh, they described far more serious incidents to us, um, you know, uh, and just sort of an old boys club culture at the Capitol. So if you're a woman looking to advance, um, it's it can be difficult if you're trying to network with men who may take that differently, um, or men are trying to get close to you and you don't realize it's because you're being sexualized and not <laughs> represented as a professional in that relationship. Would you say that, Lauren, there's a culture shift that a younger generation is coming up, and we're going to talk about the number of women who are now working reporting in politics, the, the press corps in Lansing that has shifted in age and in gender. Would you say that the generation coming up is saying, you know what, no, 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 this is not, we don't just brush this aside. Absolutely. And the national research does bear that out. Um, I talked to several experts um, in this field, in this space, and um, especially from millennial women on, you are seeing this trend of younger women who are more comfortable um, calling this out as they see it. Um, and part of that is absolutely due to having more women in these spaces, um, seeing more women in elected office. There's, there's more women staff. There's more women reporters, as you mentioned. There's, there's more women in these spaces. And let's talk a little bit about that support from your employer. And, and Emily, what is really the difference between the House and the Senate policies that we have right now when it comes to reporting, enforcement, and, and consequence? Is there a difference? One overarching issue, I think, is that there is no mechanism to fire a lawmaker. So, you know, you could have the worst sexual harasser in the world working every day um, mm -hmm. and there would be no mechanism. Like your incentive to report as an employee is diminished because there is no ultimate consequence. So so the House underwent uh, uh, some revisions to their policy um, back in 2017, 2018 is when those conversations happened. And the Senate went through a months long process to make some revisions uh, very recently um, after the instance with former Senator Lucido. They're, they're pretty similar um, in terms of, you know, the trainings that are offered, uh, the reporting processes um, instead, of, be, because of the way the House and Senate are set up, um, reports are made to the House and Senate business office or uh, someone who is experiencing harassment or discrimination could file a complaint with the Michigan Department of Civil Rights. Now, I talked to a lot of legislative staff. Many, many of them said that they didn't feel comfortable in that the reporting process would uh, result in a positive resolution for them. What has the reaction been from this series of reporting that you have done? I can only imagine the conversations that are happening. I really appreciated uh, the number of people who were saying this this is, is an issue, especially the women who came forward and were talking about how this is something that they've experienced too. There was also a sense from men too, I think that they didn't realize the extent that this was happening to their female colleagues and peers. And so I think the hope moving forward is that these conversations will happen um, at every level of state government about how they can be a better employer to women who may be experiencing this, um, how they can uh, help women feel more comfortable coming forward if they're experiencing sexual harassment. So the saddest set of reactions I got was um, from people who had left the state because of this atmosphere um, or who had left politics because of really? this atmosphere. And so I was surprised to hear from women who said, you know, I worked at the house in the 90s or I worked at the house before you got there and I'm depressed to see that this hasn't changed. Like I left for these reasons. Um, those were the, the feedback that stuck with me the most because um, I realized just sort of the, I mean, this is a, a hidden brain drain on some level. I mean, these are passionate, talented women who are finding success when they move out of state and when they move out of this toxic um, sexist bubble. You wrote the article, the four ways that Michigan can start addressing this, elect more women, more direct support from men, invest in transparency with reporting systems, and keep talking about it. Those four solutions were kind of the culmination of all of Emily and I's reporting. Uh, those were the uh, the things that we heard the most frequently from, from all of the people that we spoke with in the course of reporting this story. Um, and I think, I think having more women in these spaces, particularly spaces of power, 
um, has moved the needle quite a bit in terms of how much people are willing to talk about this and, and fundamentally just noticing how people um, you know, interact at the Capitol. Something that was brought up over and over again was talking about it with men, men especially who are in these positions of power who have the ability to enact change. I hope that people sort of take our reporting and run with it. Um, you know, at a very basic level, someone who is maybe fresh out of college or still in college and an intern in the Capitol um, and is experiencing this, um, I want them to be able to look at this story and realize, oh, this isn't me. I'm not crazy. Like, I'm not alone. You know, I, I think that there's a sense from women that the Whisper Network isn't good enough anymore. They're yelling the whispers. And I think that is what we need to drive the cultural change we need on this issue.